Uh, so Patrick's not a speaker. He's a businessman. Uh, Patrick is someone who's done some pretty incredible things. Uh, Ten years ago, he co-founded a company called Catcher Group. The Catcher Group. They started it in Malaysia. Uh, since then, they've successfully floated four different companies. Four different companies within the group in the last 10 years. If you understand what that means, that is a significant, significant achievement. Um, they have in digital assets and digital companies and different investments over a billion dollars of holdings. And to be able to create that in a very short period of time is quite extraordinary. So I said he's not a public speaker. He's going to talk about his five P's for success. A bit like Michelle's three C's for success. Uh, this is going to be a really cool opportunity, but it's his first time on stage, so we want to make sure we support him and get him out here with an appropriate National Achievers Congress welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you could be upstanding, my friends, uh, and welcome to the first time ever, I think, to a big audience like this, please could you put your hands together and welcome to the stage Patrick Grove. Give Patrick a big hand. Patrick! Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start with saying I'm really, really honored to be here in front of all of you today. It's a little bit daunting. Didn't realize it would be uh, 4,000 people when I was asked to come down. Thought it would be more be like 40 people. But um, here we are. So what I wanted to start with is I used to live in Sydney. I went, to, I went to high school here. I went to university here. And I left Sydney in 1999 to move back to Singapore. <clears throat> and the reason was because I had studied every rich list in the world, BRW rich list, Forbes rich list, et cetera, et cetera, and I concluded that if I wanted to do something significant on the financial aspect of my life, I had to be in an industry that had amazing promise and amazing opportunity. So I concluded that the internet was that industry, and I also realized that I needed to move to a market that was sizable. So what I did is I moved back to Singapore in 1999, and I launched an internet company called Catcher.com. And what was really funny is that we've had a very long, interesting journey. And you know, there's no point in me sharing my story because um, <clears throat> I only have 14 minutes left. So what I thought I'd do is I condense it into five Ps to success. I really tried to summarize what I think are the five critical ingredients to really take yourself or your business to other levels. So. If you're like me and you're taking notes furiously, here are the five Ps. Number one, problem. <clears throat> if you want to build a big, beautiful, amazing, sizable business, you've got to pick a really, really big problem. So I'll give you an example of Google. When Google launched in 1999, they wanted to put all of the world's information at one place. And in the early days, it was very folk. They just wanted to disrupt the yellow pages and the white pages. I don't even know if anyone even uses those products anymore. And they just said, if we can tackle this problem so that anyone in the world, someone in Sydney, someone in America, someone in Africa, if they need to get a, a restaurant phone number or a company address, they can find it from one website rather than a thousand different yellow pages books across the world. And by tackling a big problem and solving that problem, they managed to build a business when they IPO would worth $60 billion. What's really interesting is that if you look at the value of all of the yellow pages companies across the world, within seven years, it went from 60 billion to 1 billion. So this example is when you decide to tackle a really big problem and you offer a better product, there's huge, tremendous value to be gained. So one of the things that, <clears throat> back to my story, when we left Australia in 1999 and moved back to Southeast Asia to build a big business. The big problem that we wanted to solve, or we believed in, was, and this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, was that we realized that <clears throat> of the 700 million people in Southeast Asia, every year about 25 to 30 million people move from lower class to middle class. So we knew that there was this huge, huge opportunity to give the middle class things that they wanted. And when we thought about, well, what is it that they want? Well, when you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the needs and desires of a human being follow this pattern. The first thing that you want is you want water, you want food, you want sleep. The second thing is you want safety, you want a roof over your head. 
Thirdly, you want love. Fourth, you want esteem. You want entertainment and so on and so forth. So as we build our businesses, we said, <clears throat> let's focus on these 30 million people every year joining the middle class. And then what we did is that we ended up building businesses that the first business that we built was called iProperty because we wanted to help everyone find a home to live. The second business <clears throat> that we built was a company called iCar, which was the largest network of car portals across Southeast Asia because we felt that once everyone had somewhere to live, they would want to have a car next. So our thinking was just follow the middle class, layer that on top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <clears throat> if you look at the latest business that we started, it's called iFlix. It's basically, if you know something like Stan or you know something like Netflix, it's a similar version for Asia available on your mobile phone. So we, we recognize now that there's 300 million people in Southeast Asia in a middle class, have a roof, have a car. What do they want next? They want to be entertained. So what was interesting is that the way that we framed how we think about the problem that we're tackling. <clears throat> Number two, and this is most important, is passion. When you have a really, really big problem that you want to solve, you've got to be really passionate about that problem. You can't be passionate about someone else's problem. So the problem that I just shared with you, this problem of this emerging middle class in Southeast Asia, it was very passionate to me because I was born and raised in Southeast Asia. This was something that was very local to me. I was passionate to do something for this emerging middle class. So what it means is that sometimes it's not about the great idea that you think is going to make a lot of money. It's really about what does your heart tell you is the great idea that you're willing to give everything for to build. <clears throat> when you talk to a lot of the most successful investors in the world, you say, what do you invest in? Do you invest in the entrepreneur's passion or do you invest in the entrepreneur's amazing business plan? 99% of the world's best investors say it doesn't matter about the business plan. It matters about the passion of the entrepreneur. And the thinking is because if you have an amazing business plan, but your passion is average, you're going to eventually lose to an entrepreneur that has incredible passion, but an average business plan. Because what happens over time is the guy with the best passion puts in more love, puts in more effort, puts in brings a better team, and eventually his average business plan becomes the better business plan. So if you talk to any professional investor in the world, they always pick passion over business plan. So what it means is that it's not so much about what does the investor like, is what is your heart like? What, what do you really want to build with your life? What do you really want to build with your business? Figure it out. What is it that you're passionate? Don't figure out what you think makes a lot of money. Figure out what are you genuinely passionate about? And if it's something that you're passionate about, you will find a way to be really successful at that particular endeavor. <clears throat> when I was at National Chief of Congress in Singapore about 12 years ago, I wrote down my rules for what business would I get involved in and what were my passion statements. It's similar to, if you listen to anyone talk about relationships, how do you know when you found the one? How do you know when you found the love of your life? It's very similar to a, to a great idea or a great business. How do you know when you found the business that you're willing to give everything to? So I wrote down two rules. Rule number one, I would rather risk everything than risk nothing. If I found an idea or business that resonated with that rule, then I knew that was the business that I wanted to be involved in. Rule number two, <clears throat> I would rather work seven days a week, and I do work seven days a week, I would rather work seven days a week for nothing with people I love on something that I'm passionate for instead of working five days a week for a big fat salary with people that I don't love on something that I don't care about. It, it's, it's sometimes really hard to share like how important these guiding principles are in <clears throat> helping you find the right business or the right venture that you want to get involved in. It, it literally is like love at first sight. When you find that thing that you're willing to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day for, that is the right thing to do. That is the right thing to give everything to. Don't ever do something because you think it's going to make a lot of money. Do something 
because you're, some part of you feels really passionate about fixing that problem. Three, people. <clears throat> I think a lot of people always say, yep, build a great team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of people give lip service to this. I'll tell you something interesting. When you look at the top 10 biggest companies in the world, most of them today are internet oriented companies. And we look at their stuff, and we look at those companies, the majority of the most successful companies in the world have more than one founder. I'll tell you why that's interesting. Tackling a big problem is not easy. It's challenging, it's late nights, it's change, uh, brainstorming ideas, do we do this, do we do that, do we launch tomorrow, do we launch next week, do we go into state, do we hire this guy, do we hire that lady, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Companies that have co-founders consistently do better than companies that are founded by one person. That's, that's not saying that it's impossible to build a great business as a sole operator, but statistically speaking, you have the right dynamics and your right check and balances to build a great big business when you have co-founders in your business. So something worth thinking about, when you look at all these great big companies, the way they evolved was because they had co-founders who were able to bounce each other, do I do this, do I do that? And when you have someone that you can have that conversation with every day, that is the great way to build a great business. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is a photo in our Hong Kong office, actually in Hong Kong yesterday, and um, one of the things that we place a lot of emphasis on, and sometimes people outside in the industry might say we're too ruthless, is that if someone is working really well, irregardless of experience, irregardless of age, irregardless of ethnicity, it, it, that doesn't matter. If someone is a performer, double down, expand their scope, give them more to do. But equally important, which most people fail to do, if someone is not a performer, you need to do something about it. And I've seen too many businesses get held back because they don't have a team that they love and respect and cherish working with for whatever reason. So if you're a founder of a business today and there's someone in your senior leadership team that you don't think is absolutely effing amazing, you really need to do something about it this week, not next week, not next month, not because your business can't wait because if you don't do something about it, your competitor will. And you know what, this is, this is a challenge that every company has. It's always easy to hire, but it's really hard to get rid of the wrong person. You know, it's, it's funny, building a great business is no different to building a great relationship. It's easy to jump into a romantic relationship, it's hard to get out of the wrong relationship. It's exactly the same. And you know, every time in our career where we've had a very challenging situation with an individual, stressed about it, stressed about it, when you finally remove that individual, I promise you, amazing things start to happen to the business. So invest in rock stars, but at the same time, don't ever be afraid to do something about the wrong people in your business because they will bring down your business, not you. Four, pivot. Okay, let's get a show. How many of you actually are involved in your own business? Okay. Reason why I put up this roller coaster, this is probably describes my average emotions as an entrepreneur in the typical week. Do, do, do the entrepreneurs in the room agree with that? Up, down, up, down, everything goes really fast, great, everything goes really, sometimes it goes upside down, you don't know what the hell just happened. This is the emotional intensity of a typical entrepreneur's week. So, why is pivot important? If you study the most successful companies in the world, the one consistent thing that they have is that whatever they were doing 10 years ago is different from what they do today. Whatever they were doing 20 years ago is different from what they were doing today. When you study companies, big, fat, behemoth companies that eventually die, what's consistent about them, whatever they did 10 years ago is the same thing they're doing today. Let's look at the biggest company in the world today, Apple. Apple's most profitable business unit 
is selling phones. Apple's not a computer company anymore. It's a phone company. But Apple started making computers. And at some point, Steve Jobs said, this is great, but I want something bigger. I want to solve bigger problems. So you know what? I want to put a device in everyone's hand. What can I do? So what happened seven years ago is that Apple pivoted their business and launched the iPod. I'm sure you guys will remember that. That was a complete change for that business. And then five years ago, Steve Jobs said, this is great. I have music in everyone's pocket. I want to do more. There's bigger problems that I want to solve. And he said, you know what? Let's change that iPod into an iPhone. This is a guy who pivoted his core product set every 12 months. Is it any coincidence that it's the biggest company in the world today? So no matter how big or how small your business is, you've got to constantly be pivoting your business. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why pivoting is important is because it allows you to keep finding out what is that thing that makes your business better, <clears throat> bigger, and stronger. If there's anything, in my mind, the CEO should really be called the CPO, the Chief Pivot Officer. You've got to constantly keep trying and trying new things. The more things you try, the closer you get to finding to trying the thing that works. I just put up a quick list. The gentleman before me was so kindly to introduce us as four public companies, blah, 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 blah. I think one of the reasons why I feel so honored to be on stage is not because of that, is because we have about 20 ideas that we tried, launched, put money on, put people on, and completely failed miserably. We have failed everything that we tried for a long, long period of time. And it was only eventually that we finally figured out a few things that thankfully worked. I know Richard Branson is speaking later today. Everyone can name, say, five or eight companies that Virgin Group has been very successful for. If you actually read his bi biography, Virgin Group has launched 300 companies globally, only of which 20 are around today. That's because they are a machine at pivoting, trying, pivoting, trying, pivoting, trying, and then sticking with the ones that work. <clears throat> OK. So everyone who has their own business, we're going to do a little quick survey. Put your hand up. OK, keep your, hand up if you're, keep your hand up if your business lost money for the first 12 months. First two years, first three years, first four years, five years. Is it just me? <laughs> Six years, seven years, okay, eight years. Catcha lost money for eight years before we finally had something of significance and of value that was able to list on the Australian Stock Exchange. So, I think that goes back to the point is we were pivoting like crazy until we finally found something that worked. <clears throat> Last point, perseverance. This to me is the most important point of the five Ps. I think if you, if you, do, if you only remember one thing today, it's about having the perseverance to keep going. Winston Churchill said it well, never, never, never give up. Steve Jobs himself, I'm convinced that what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful is pure perseverance. KFC. Colonel Sanders, it's actually in his biography, pitched something like 120 people before finally someone said, hey, Mr. Old Guy in overalls, I will fund your chicken restaurant. 100 plus meetings before, and now KFC is everywhere in the world. Let me go back to this story. So we had eight years of losing money. And you know what? Those are eight beautiful years <clears throat> because we learned so much about what works and what doesn't work. Um, in 2007, we said, you know what? We want to launch a beautiful property portal to help serve all of the great people in Southeast Asia looking for a home. I said, OK. I went to the first. We had no money, so I went to investors saying, hey, will you help fund this business? No. Investor number two, will you fund this business? No. Investor number three, no. Investor number four. And you would keep hearing, well, if it was going to work, someone would have already done it. <laughs> right? So in the end, I counted. It was the 75th meeting where someone finally said, I will invest in iProperty. 75. That is a lot of meetings. Um, 
And that gentleman put two, money, uh, two million dollars into iProperty, which today would be worth about 70 million Australian dollars. So imagine if I'd given up after meeting 30 or meeting 55 or meeting 60 it was, or meeting 74. It was really meeting 75 where someone finally said, I will give you the money you need to go and build this beautiful business. <clears throat> so in closing, it's really simple. It's five Ps. Find a big, beautiful problem. Find something that you're really passionate to solve. Not, not something that someone else is passionate to solve. Not something that someone said, hey, is going to make a lot of money. Something that you genuinely believe in your heart is something that you will give 24-7 to. Because if you want to build a great business, you will have to give 24-7. No one does this alone. This is hard stuff. So build a rock star team. Work with people that you love and people that you respect. And there may be people that you love, but you don't respect their working ability. Well, then they belong somewhere else. So find people that you respect on a working level to solve this big problem together. And you know what? Keep pivoting until something works. We pivoted for eight years until we found something that worked. Lastly, if nothing works, have the perseverance to try again and keep trying again until something finally works. It doesn't sound that hard, right? So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For, I hope this was interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you guys all soon. Thank you.